Okay, today we're looking at Matthew chapter 24 and 25. Chapter 25, 
verses 31 to 46. And I'm just going to read for us from verses, verse 31. I'm not going to read the whole thing. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and, gave me, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? And when did you, we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king, the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these of my brethren, you did it to me. This is such an interesting passage, because guess what you need? Guess what is a very, very vital detail that you cannot have overlooked if you want to be prepared for the coming of the Lord? If you want, when the Lord returns with his holy angels and you want to, him to say to you, welcome, I welcome you. The, the detail that we cannot overlook, as seen here, and as seen, and I haven't counted it, I haven't run the stats, in many, many of Jesus' parables, is it's about how we treat one another. It is about with what attitude do we look at others. And a lot of people are going to look at this passage and they're going to say, well, I feed the homeless, I do this, 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 and that. I'm going to say that's actually maybe even easier than what Jesus is calling us to do here. He says, and I'm going to find the verse. so significant. Um, Jesus tells us, who are, who are my brothers? Who, they are the people who do the will of God. Who are my brethren? And in Hebrews, it tells us the holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. There are people that are Christians. They are in church. There are people that we might see all the time. There are people that we serve with, and there are people that are so, we are so easily annoyed with. And they are not strangers to us but they may be in some need. And because of that, Jesus says, look, I'm calling you to feed them, to clothe them, to embrace them in all that you see of their shortcomings, in all that you might see every day. It is always easier to serve the stranger. It is always easier to be kind to someone you don't know. It is always harder to have seen the reality and be, let down your guard and be who you are, really, and see others for who they are and say, forget it. I can't stand that guy. I'm not, you know, someone else will help them. And Jesus is calling us in this. He says, you know what, if you want to be ready, when I was hungry, give me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you took me in. And it's so important to Jesus how we treat each other, no? And a lot of you might think, well, okay, look, I have never once, well, maybe once or twice, I'm not going to use hunger for Jonathan because we see him hungry like, you know, he's always hungry, right? But when have, when have you ever seen Peter hungry? I've never seen Peter hungry. When have you seen any of us in need of clothing? When were any of us ever in prison? Just about never, I would dare to say, right? But do we see, Jesus is looking at the principle here, what are the eyes that we look at each other with? Do we see the need in our brothers and sisters? Do we see, you know, when, when I think of naked, sometimes you're naked physically as someone, there are those out there, very few in our community who need clothing. 
they have a lack of clothing. But do you ever see um, your brothers and sisters and something bad has happened to them? And they are naked before the world. They're put to shame. You know what I mean? And the temptation is saying, hey, you know, wow, look at that little, mm, look, at, look at what happened there. And it's exposed even more. Or do we cover that? Do we cover that with our words, with the way we treat them? Do we still embrace them? Have you ever seen, have you ever seen those of us around, hungry, in need? Maybe we need love and support. Maybe, you know, prison is always the one that gets me because have you ever spoken to someone who is so angry about something and bitter about something? And it's always easy to say and go down. You know, and being negative is so easy, right? Yeah, I can't believe that person did that. I can't believe that happened to you. And they are enchained within their own hearts. They are imprisoned in their own hearts. And they can't get out of it. And they can't set that free. They just can't let it go. And you visit them. And it's not your job to set them free, right? It doesn't say that here, but you visited them. You let them know that we're here for you to support you in that. When, when, they were, when they were sick. And this we see much more, right? Um, those of us who, you know, we get sick. And we care for them. We care for them. And this is, this really, to me, it speaks so deeply of the love of Jesus. How many of you like to be alone? I don't think anybody wants to be found alone. You may, you may think, yeah, sometimes I'm just so tired of people. But you never want, I don't think there's any of us who want, in a dire situation, I've got no one to call on. I have no one around me. And this is Jesus' love for each one of us. And I think we have all experienced someone fed us. Someone clothed us in our shame. They cover an ugly situation for us. Somebody visited me and cared for me. Someone walked me down from extreme anger or extreme negativity. Someone prayed for me. Someone helped me. And that support. And isn't it amazing that Jesus puts that around us? And he is saying to us, look, if you want, you want to be prepared for when I come again, treat my family well. Treat them well. Support them. Love them. Care for them. And that is his calling. He says, that is what is separating the sheep from the goats. It is that love for your brothers and sisters. It is that, not only to say it, but to do it. I'm gonna go out there, you know what? Is, is Gloria not feeling, she didn't look too good today. I'm gonna to go care for her. I don't know what Jonathan did, but I'm gonna go care for Gloria, right? I'm gonna go, when Jesus puts this notice upon my heart, you know what, Jesus looks at today. Yeah, maybe there's something going on. Maybe he needs prayer. I'm sure we all need prayer. And Jesus has done that for us, through those around us, and he's calling us to go do that same. It's so easy to say, but you know what? Those are the people I go to church with. Those are not really my friends. And there's a group of them. And Jesus is saying, look, this is my family. And do you want to be prepared? Do you want to be prepared for my calm and my glory? This is one of the things. It is a big deal. This is one of the things that I'm calling you to do. Care for each other. It sounds so simple, yet it is going to require a life from us because guess what? What about me? We live in a generation where, um, and I don't think it's anything new, but is, is one of the uh, mottos, the go-to slogans for this generation is a treat yourself. You want to treat yourself? Guess what you're going to have in the end when you treat yourself? You're going to have yourself. And your things. It's a lonely path to walk. And I don't think it's anything new. I think back in the day, uh, it was called, I'm just watching that from number one. And guess how many people are in that number one? That's what you end up with. How about it's a dog eat dog world? Everyone ends up dead then. You're never going to be top dog, right? It's been generation after generation, no matter how it's put, it's the same principle. And it's the same fear that the enemy constantly drives into our hearts. If I have, if I make this much money, I 
have to use some of it on myself or else I will run out. If I have these things in this amount of time, if I don't use it well on myself, then I will run out. I will be burned out. I will be done at the end of the day. Um, one of our principles for Jason and I, I think we've always, and this is something that we believe in so strongly, if the Lord, if we don't, listen, we, we have not a penny to our names. If the Lord today dropped from heaven two loaves of bread, do you know why he did that? It's so we could take one loaf and share it with someone else. Why would God give me two loaves and give Josh none? It's so I can walk over there to Josh and say, hey, you want to share the bread? And that's, that is a policy, a philosophy, a principle that I think that is so important, and it stems from this passage right here. As much as you've done it to one of your brethren, then you've done it to me. Because we love the Lord and we love his people. Deuteronomy, there's a slave and he, he goes and he, he, he's able to be set free, the indentured servant, but he says, I don't want to be set free. Why? Because I love my master and his household. And his household. I know most certainly if you treat my kids well, I'm very happy, right? If you don't treat my kids well, and teachers, you know, when you don't treat kids well, parents will come after you. They will, they will come after you with all they got because it is an extension of who they are. And that is, that is the mindset that Jesus is trying to establish here. You know, it's not just about, you can come and worship me all day long. You can sing praises to me all day long. But you know what, what I want to know is, how are you treating my family? What is your attitude towards them? Now, what if you run out? And this is the one thing that you must do for yourself. You must have it for yourself. Let's come back to the beginning of chapter 25. Um, the parable, there's a parable here, and I'm going to read, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Why do you think they took their lamps to meet the bridegroom? You're going to get married, okay? And then you're going to go to the ceremony, and the bridegroom comes to pick you up. This is what happens, okay? Your, your bridegroom, the groom is coming to pick you up, and the first thing you do is you go and you grab a lamp. Why? What do you think that's all about? Why, why do we need a lamp? <clears throat> what do lamps do? They give light. They give light. So they need light on their way to meet the bridegroom. At some point, the understanding is there's not enough light here. Right? Okay. So they went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. All ten of them took their lamps. All ten had lamps. It's not like someone didn't have a lamp. Right? All ten of them. Um, up, we, we were just up at camp, and, uh, you know, when I was up there even earlier, so there's a, there's a meeting house for kids, and they call it the lodge, and, and then there's our cabins. And between the meeting house and my cabin, there's like a narrow stretch of path, a little dirt road, and it can maybe fit, I don't know, three or four people across. But, and for some reason, it takes a little curve, and if you don't have a light, I always felt like I was just going to, I always, you know, I, I didn't need a really bright light, because the cabin's not too far, and I can use my phone light, and I, you know, I always forgot to bring a flashlight with me. But you could just walk off into the woods, like kind of fall down the little hilly, you know, little hill. You need a light, because it's pretty dark out there. The stars aren't really enough to give you any guidance for light, right? Okay, so they took the lamps, they all had them. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. This is like how many of you have been in a place, you need a flashlight, and you found out the flashlight you have with you didn't have batteries. Has this happened to anyone ever? Or is it just me? It's happened to me like all the time. You know, you turn it on and you find out this flashlight has no battery. So let's just, let's just go with that, okay? They took their flashlights, they all knew to bring them, but some of them did not have fresh batteries in their flashlight, okay? But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. In that little flashlight, they had fresh batteries. And at mid end, but while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Okay, so they kind of knew this was going to happen, I think, right? He went away to do something. He, he didn't come back on time, necessarily. There was a time where they're sleeping. Okay? And they're sleeping, and it's nighttime, is the assumption. And then that's when you might really need light to go somewhere. And at midnight, the cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Okay, so now they have to leave the place they are, the cabin, the tent, 
the lodge, the hut, the whatever it is in that day, and they're going to go out into this road where there's no, there's no street lights at that time, right? You have to have your own light. You need some guidance. There's five of them. It works. They have a lamp. They have a light. Five of them are like, we had no oil in our lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. It wasn't that they weren't lit. They were going out. It was going to last. They understood that like, I'm not going to get all the way there. It's nighttime. I'm not going to get all the way there. And while they and the wise answered, saying, No, yes, there should be not enough for us and you, but rather go to those who sell and buy for yourself. I don't know where, where are they going to buy this in the middle of the night. And the idea is this oil has to be bought. You have to give up something. Something needs to be given up. This oil has to be bought. And while they went to buy it, and so they did it. In the middle of the night, they're going to go buy some oil. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. And already went in with him to the wedding and the door was shut. So here they're going out, okay, and the bride the bridegroom is not static. He's walking too, right? And he's coming towards them. And so as they go to buy this oil, they are left outside. And this is the one thing, the first thing, you know, Jesus mentions you gotta do you have to have this for yourself. It's not something you can share with someone else. And what is the oil in that lamp? And I dare say that it is the oil of the Holy Spirit. Again and again, the Bible tells us it is the Holy Spirit. How can you, how can you look at people who are sad and say, look, I'm going to go talk to them? How can you look at people who may, have, may or may not have physical needs and say, you know what, I'm going to try to help them in this? You are going to be, yeah, you will be burned out because guess what? There's not enough oil in there. And you need to constantly replenish that oil. And I would dare say that it is not just to meet the needs of others, but for your relationship with Jesus here, for your relationship with Jesus to meet the bridegroom. And he is delayed now, is he not? We don't know when Jesus will return. We don't know. But do we have oil in our lamps? Or are we left really in the dark just trying to plot along, making sure that we don't fall off? We're, you know, at the last minute, we're going to say, um, how many of you have had a final that you've never studied before? And the night before, you open up a textbook, and you're like, I'm just going to learn everything there is to learn tonight, right now, for an 8 a.m. final. It's probably not the best practice. That is, that is knowledge that you should have bought and earned and kept throughout the semester, right, or throughout the quarter, throughout your time. But the temptation is always in I'll be fine, right? And at the end, you're like, what are these words? What is this saying? Does anyone in this room have a dictionary? <laughs> I've never seen this before in my life. I've definitely had that experience because the prep work was not done. And the same with our relationship with Jesus comes a time, and you know what, I, I, I would say that it's not even when the Lord returns. For me, a lot of times I feel like, you know what, if my relationship with Jesus, with Jesus were much stronger, if I had oil, much more oil in this lamp to shine brightly, if I could just pray and this person would be healed, as in Jesus' day, because of his relationship with the Father, if I had that same relationship, had I spent all that time, if I had enough faith to do this, those around me would be different. I would affect my surroundings to that effectiveness. Does that, does that, does that make a sense to you guys? It is that oil in the lamp. Do we have that oil? And do we really want that oil in the lamp? Are we always prepared? Um, I like to keep I'm very paranoid. I like to always have new batteries all around our house. You know, we have to have a box where there is every type of battery imaginable. I recently bought quadruple A's because there are some things that ask for quadruple A batteries. Not double A's, not triple A's, quadruple A batteries. Those little button batteries, I need to have them available. Those little flat disc batteries that go into your car remote, the day that your car remote dies, I have some and you're going to be thankful. You know, it's things like that. I like to be prepared, but that is in our physical realm. What about in the spiritual realm? Do you have oil in your lamp? 
Jesus has the, Jesus wants you to serve those around you. Do you have oil in your lamp? What you do and how you interact with others, how you serve those around you, it's going to determine your inter e or eternal future. But the first question is, do you have oil in your lamp in your relationship with Jesus? Is there, is, does the Holy Spirit bring joy and comfort and peace into your life? Does it give you, does he give you guidance day by day, moment by moment? And had you had that, wouldn't your life be much better? Wouldn't it be much better just knowing God's got my back? How do I know that? Not only because his word tells me, but the Holy Spirit, moment by moment, speaks to me and confirms that to me. Wouldn't that be amazing? It would be something different. It would be something different. When I'm worried, or when I'm a little bit sad, or when I, you know, I tend to be a little more cynical and negative than probably most people. When I have that kind of perspective on things, but the Holy Spirit shows me Jesus within that situation. When I have a different outlook in life, when it all come together and be much more lucid. Now we come to the uh, the, the two passage, the two passages, the one with the talents, okay, the one before that in chapter twenty four. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master may rule over his household to give them food in due season? Now there's a servant, and all of this you'll notice Jesus is talking about interaction with other people. How do you be prepared for his coming? It's how you interact with other people. Who is the faithful and wise servant? And I don't know how faithful and wise you have to be to know not to beat your fellow servants and deny them food. But do we beat our fellow servants? Maybe not physically. Do we complain about them? Do we, do we really berate them? Oh, and probably not, but it's talking about our attitudes to those who are serving with us. To those who are serving with us. The school I teach at, I found that it's much easier to be nice to the kids that we're teaching, the students, than the other teachers. Because I have some sort of standard for other teachers, right? I have some sort of expectation. But oftentimes, what I find rising up in my heart is I may be berating them. I may be saying this or that in my heart about them. And that's what Jesus is saying here, you know, for Christians, do we, do we really berate them? Are we beating them up just a little bit, you know? And are we denying them food? Are we denying them, are we hindering what be, having them be fed by the word? And he begins to feed his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. Now this is something that um, I feel strongly about. Who do we hang out with? A.W. Tozer says there's three, the three most important relationships in your life. The first one is those, the people, your friends, is the most important relationship in your life that will affect your walk with God. Who do you walk with? Who do you eat and drink with? Who do you hang out with when you're not doing work, when you're not doing school, when you're not doing something that's been assigned to you? When it's your choice of time, who do you hang out with? And that's going to affect you. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, and at an hour that he's not at work, and will ugh, we'll cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What, what is a hypocrite? Someone who acts, right? He, he behaved one way in this situation, another way in another situation. He's with the drunkards, and he's, the people he hangs out with, he's behaving another way. And again, this comes back to not only now how do we treat our fellow servants, but who are we? How do we interact with ourselves? Do we have integrity? Do we have that truth? Last passage for today, the parable of the talents. Um, some of you are very familiar with this passage. And this, we're not going to go through the whole thing. But this is what I want to say about this passage. There's two things that are going on in this passage. And in Bible studies, as we can go discuss more. But Jesus wants us to go and make more of whatever, with whatever he's given us. And you're thinking... What has Jesus given me? Well, he's probably given you lots. He's given you lots. But you're not just making more. You're making more for Jesus. You're making, you're developing more in other people to be used on Jesus. to be, And they will go and develop more. Does that make sense? It could be time. It could be energy. It could be money. It could be a host of things that there is more for. Um, it could also be more love. 
It can also be more joy. There is a lot of mores out there. And Jesus has given you certain, and it just happens to coincide with our word for talent. I don't think I'm particularly talented, but I will say Jesus has given me talents in terms of this is something that you can go and use and invest in my kingdom. The other day, uh, someone told me, I asked, you know, we we're talking about, oh my goodness, Facebook is down by 25% overnight. And, and, and a person we know that that's an investment person said, time to buy more. And this person is always thinking, right? How do, how do I make more of my money? How do, I, how, do I, how do I go about this? And this is the attitude that Jesus wants us to have when we look at what's put in our hands, when we look at what we have. What do you have? That's a question you need to ask. You may have, you know, I love that, you know, musical ability. You see, you know, you might come and you, you see, the first week you see Jonathan playing his tube, and you're like, well, if Jonathan can do that, then maybe I can do it, right? It was okay. It wasn't, no, it was amazing. But let's just say, you know, you thought, oh, that, that was kind of neat, but I don't know. Martin plays a trumpet. I've never seen a trumpet on the worship team, but now I can do it too, and that's what works. And the next person was like, well, hey, look, if, if they can do that, then I, maybe I can serve the Lord. You have just increased that talent, right? Um, I'm not good at writing little notes and cards, some people. You've increased it. And this is a very basic understanding of what does it mean to increase that talent. But now there's one guy, he says, I'm gonna go, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna do anything, I'm not gonna increase it. What could that be? What is burying it in the room? Maybe you're just treating yourself. Right? Maybe you're just using it. I'm gonna use it all on myself. There's no increase here at all. But I do have some nice socks. Right? I do have some nice things. You've used it all yourself. Or maybe you've literally just done nothing with it. Every day you come in, you go out, you, you go about your business and life, you do, you've never shared about Jesus, nothing. Again, that would be, you've just taken it, you've swallowed it. You've put it in there, there's no more. And why is that? One of the things that Jesus berates this guy for is, he says, look, I was afraid to use it because you're so mean, and I was afraid that I'd lose it, you know? I'd afraid that once I spent it, it would be wasted, because, and I know that you're mean. I know that you, you, you are very exacting. And it's his attitude towards the Lord. Do we believe that the Lord will give us more? Do we believe that when he calls us to spend, it's not a waste? And it's about how do we approach Jesus, how do we approach God the Father? He has given us such grace and such love, yet oftentimes we find that is for me. I spend it on me. And, and so Jesus, and I'm gonna wrap this up, Jesus is saying, look, this, this, what I'm looking for when I come back is the person who cares about, who loves me and loves my family. The person who is going to go out and he understands my heart and it is a heart to share, to share all the good things that I've given you, to, to really spread it and to say, look, I'm not gonna run out. It is the person also who cares enough about meeting me and they're gonna have oil in that lamp. Um, and as we continue today for our breaking of bread, you know, Give that thanks to the Lord. Because if, you, if someone's going to hear, well, you know what? Josh prayed. I can pray too. I can, I can thank the Lord for what I have. And give him that worship and praise because he has given us so much. And that really gives value, I know, for my life because of how much he has given to us, how much he has given to me personally. And that's something that's worthy of thanks. And I'm going to ask Peter to come back up.